The latest economic data from China paints a gloomy picture with slower than expected growth. As the World Bank warns of the risk of a worldwide recession next year, what could problems in China mean for the global economy? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The saying used to be, when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. Now the global focus is just as much on China. COVID-19 has had an impact on the financial health of the world's second largest economy, and it's contagious. So when the latest economic data from Beijing showed weaker than expected results, concerns spread worldwide. We'll be delving into those statistics in a moment, but first, Richard Kimber in Hong Kong tells us about the reaction to the figures. There is a growing sense of unease and uncertainty among the Chinese public about just how successfully the country can manage this crucial transition period between what has been a near zero tolerance approach to coronavirus cases to now one in which society and the economy are both rapidly opening up again. Talking to business consultants in the country, they say that employers are finding that their workforce are reluctant to go to the office right now and the companies themselves are reluctant to hire new staff all because of an uncertainty about the future of the economy and the future of COVID-19 transmission risk in a country that has largely been insulated from any type of widespread transmission because of there being so many rules and restrictions in place. That same logic is meaning that some parents are reluctant to send their children to school and talking to shoppers on the street. They don't want to go to busy places or spend much money or because of this uncertainty about how the next few months will unfold. Economic analysts say this will likely set back by some months any chance of there being a quick and efficient economic rebound in China. They're expecting it maybe the middle of next year before we see anything close close to the type of pre-pandemic growth that China was used to. This is affecting, of course, not just domestic Chinese companies and their ability to hire and expand, but also international companies who rely so heavily on China's manufacturing capability for their global supply chains. And so the next few months are being seen as a crucial step in China's COVID-19 experience to see just how much the world's second largest economy can bounce back after these rules have suddenly all been relaxed. Richard Kimber for Inside Story. According to China's National Bureau of Statistics, retail sales fell nearly 6% in November from a year ago, the biggest drop since May. Industrial production growth slowed to 2.2%, less than half of October's growth. Property investment, which accounts for as much as 30% of GDP, has plunged by nearly 20% year on year. And unemployment worsened, rising to nearly 6%, its highest in six months. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Beijing. Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. In Washington, D.C., Shirley Z. Yu, a fellow at the Ash Center of Harvard Kennedy School. And in Sangalan, Switzerland, Guido Kotzi, a professor of macroeconomics at the University of Sangalan. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Andy, let me start with you today. The fact that China, the world's second largest economy, is reporting another slump, how concerning is that inside China and how concerning is that outside of China? Well, thanks for having me on, and I think this is an incredibly important question, uh, Mohammed. Uh, I think that uh, really we should not be concerned at all. Uh, let me provide a little bit of context. Uh, we've seen the Chinese government win the battle against COVID, which started out uh, with the Delta variant, which had an RO or a reproduction number of about two to the latest variant, which has a R naught of something like 16, which is eight times uh, as infectious and about as infectious as the measles, but fortunately, much less lethal. So this is, I think we can understand the rapid uh, relaxation of these very strict COVID policies. And what this means is that the fundamental conditions are in place for a very powerful economic rebound, not only because we're moving into the post-COVID era in China, but other uh, policy decisions as well around real estate, around encouraging consumption uh, beyond just uh, moving past COVID. 
Uh, we've seen the political situation uh, move forward as well with the 20th Party Congress. So I think all of these elements are in place. Mm. That being said, the next few months will be very, very difficult economically. Uh, Andy, if I could just follow up with you uh, for a second. Uh, you're talking about the fact that, you know, China is starting to roll back its, its COVID restrictions. I mean, obviously, this is going to be a delicate time, a delicate transitional time for the economy. Uh, China can't really look to other countries as far as what other countries did when, when they dealt with opening their economies back up, because China's experience is, is, is quite different. Uh, you had the zero COVID policy that was implemented for, for so long and is only now starting uh, to, to be eased. I mean, has there been enough done to to really plan on how to navigate this this time of great transition? Well, Mohammed, I you know I'm not sure how much of a transition is required. Now, again, uh, there is some risk here. The question mark is is the this latest variant or these variants. Uh, much milder or as mild as uh, people believe. And if so, uh, there are many people uh, coming down with COVID uh, in Beijing and increasingly across China today. The latest uh, statistics I saw, more than 50% uh, in in Beijing already have COVID. Now, if it lasts a week or two, I think people will be moving back to normal. And of course, uh, there is some psychological hesitation. Uh, everyone has developed new habits, new muscle memory mm. uh, about behavior that will take some time to change. Uh, but again, I think the sectors that really matter, uh, look at real estate, uh, look at uh, consumption, look at exports. Uh, government plays a very, very important role here. And government has indicated very clearly that uh, economic growth will be the priority for 2023 and beyond. And we see this with uh, local provincial governments uh, arranging for charter flights to countries around the world to promote businesses. Um, you know, we may see uh, some very direct measures to stimulate consumption, mm. uh, certainly in monetary fiscal policy as well. So mm. I think, again, uh, the short term, and we'll probably touch on this, uh, is very challenging. It's very, very challenging. But I think uh, looking ahead, uh, we can expect a pretty powerful rebound. Uh, Shirley, I, I saw you reacting to some of what Andy was saying there. It, it looked like you wanted to jump in. Uh, before I let you do that, I, I also want to ask you, I mean, how bumpy, uh, from your perspective, how bumpy will the road ahead be for China when it comes to economic recovery? Thank you for having me, Mohammed. Uh, Andy talked about uh, two primary points. The first point is on the COVID uh, surge in China. And I think that in itself is really a huge uncertainty according to China's uh, top epidemiologists. Uh, up to 80 to 90% of the population is likely to be infected over the coming months. And so that means roughly about 1.2 billion people uh, potentially being infected uh, by COVID. And also uh, with the potential uh, of uh, uh, creating new mutations of this virus. And as China starts to open its border wider to the rest of the world, um, so now not only does uh, uh, the surge of the COVID uh, concerns China itself, but it should reasonably start to concern uh, the economies of the rest of the world as well. Now, when it comes to uh, the economic recovery, yes, it's going to be bumpy. And the, que the question is how willing uh, the government is going to be in pumping massive uh, monetary and the fiscal stimulus mm. in order to revitalize the economy. Because in, according to the COVID uh, pattern, China is somewhere around the latter part of 2020 for the rest of the world. In, in a way, after three years, uh, COVID is just starting to spread in China. So uh, the bottom line is a uh, massive stimulus will be required. And in the coming Central uh, Economic Work Conference, the understanding is that the monetary and the fiscal policy will become more expensive and China will uh, stay mm. on chart to continue to focus on economic growth priorities. Guido, from your vantage point, how disappointing or surprising uh, were these latest economic numbers? And, and also, uh, based on what you're hearing uh, from Andy and from Shirley, how long do you think it's going to take for the public in China to feel comfortable enough to, to come out again and start spending their money again? It, ha it has not been surprising. 
uh, especially because if you consider November, this was the very worst uh, month because not only we still had uh, the results of the previous restrictions, but also we had a protest and, and, and the sudden change and the administrative issues on changing stuff and everything, uh, not to mention the geopolitical isolation and so on. So uh, it, it was largely predicted. How long it will take? It depends, because it's true um, China has vaccinated uh, uh, nearly 90 percent of the population, but they relied on their own vaccines. They inactivated virus vaccines, which are much less effective than the uh, Western mRNA vaccines, or also the or the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And also they hesitated to vaccinate the the elderly. So until relatively recently, half of the over 80s in China were not vaccinated. Now the government seems determined to vaccinate uh, the elderly more aggressively. However, still, uh, I wonder with their vaccines, how how protected they will effectively be. So I think uh, it will not be, uh, so the, the, the process of reopening is, will not be so fast and people may have some reason to wait a little bit. That said, on the economic point of view, they have basically their problems are complementary to those of the West. They are basically the opposite. Here we have inflation. There mm. they don't have inflation. Latest mm. releases, 1.6 percent. OK, so there is plenty of scope for monetary policy to stimulate the economy there, which is not the case uh, um, in, in our economies, mm. where there's been uh, perhaps too much stimulus. Uh, so um, the uh, I, I see a gradual and potentially bumping and slow uh, easing uh, of, of the supply side with potentially, you know, uh, uh, good, good sprints and, and, and acceleration on the demand side. All right, let's take a step back and look at the broader picture for a moment. Since the days of Mao Zedong and isolation under communism, China's embrace of capitalism has been spectacular. It's become the world's largest exporter and second largest importer. The latest World Trade Organization figures, which cover 2020, show China had exports worth $2.6 trillion and total imports worth $2.1 trillion. That gives China a healthy trade surplus of more than half a trillion dollars. Foreign trade is worth around 35 percent of GDP, so it's vital to the country. China's biggest trading partner is the U.S., followed by the EU and ASEAN members. Trade covers a vast spectrum, but electronics and electrical equipment made up around 27 percent of both imports and exports in 2020, according to the World Bank. Uh, Shirley, l let me go to you. Um, so all eyes now are on the annual Central Economic Work Conference. Uh, that's the meeting in which Chinese leaders gather to set up the next year's economic agenda, as it were. Uh, any indication or, or any idea as to what might come out of that? Uh, it has to uh, refocus on economic growth. Uh, the key word is really stabilization. It is to stabilizing growth, uh, stabilize jobs, and uh, stabilize prices. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor correctly pointed out, uh, inflation is rather low in China. So that really offers quite a lot of economic levers for China to revitalize the economy via fiscal and the monetary stimulus. And so we are going to see the world's two largest economies moving in opposite uh, monetary and the fiscal cycles uh, in the foreseeable future. However, as China continues to stimulate uh, through monetary and the fiscal uh, uh, injections, I think that's going to continue to pose uh, some resilience to the inflation problem in the Western world and particularly adding uh, policy difficulties to the Fed as well. However, um, the trade, as you correctly mentioned, Mohammed, continues to grow despite uh, 2022, the very difficult COVID situations. And I think, uh, you know, China is going to continue to buy for becoming not only the large, uh, the world's largest exporter, but the world's largest importer. However, when it comes to GDP computation, it is really the net uh, trade, the net export rather, that matters. And so that really trade represents a rather small part of uh, China's uh, GDP today. Consumption, uh, contrarily, uh, represents about 65% of China's GDP before COVID. And so the real key revitalization for the Chinese economy is going to have to ultimately come from consumption, from consumers willing to spend the feeling hopeful about the future and gaining their jobs back. Uh, Guido, do we really understand uh, the fundamentals of how hobbled China's economy has been uh, by all of this? And, and also, uh, do people around the world understand the kind of knock-on effect all of this has outside of China? 
Well, outside of China, the effect is big because uh, in uh, in real term, despite despite the yuan renminbi uh, being a bit underpriced worldwide, the, the but the World Bank com computes uh, uh, purchasing power parity adjusted GDPs, and the GDP of China PPP adjusted. So in real terms, it's about twenty percent, ten percent. Uh, higher than that of the United States. So uh, you mentioned before in the past, uh, you know, if the United States needs, then, you know, the, the, the rest of the world had a cold. Now we have basically two United States. One is China, which is a bit stronger uh, economically at the moment and we uh, and, and predicted in 25 years to become much more strong you know much stronger about uh, two-thirds stronger than the united states so the effect of uh, supply or demand uh, reductions in china uh, are, are are immense for the rest of the world so uh, it is it mm. is still a big importer and and it's important for a for our products to have their market because also as was said you know cons domestic consumption is going to rise okay mm. so as the economy mature so i think the the effects of what happens in china are, are paramount in the rest of the world uh, andy it looked to me also like you were reacting to what guido was saying did you want to jump in well i think uh, mohammed it's certainly uh amongst uh economists and especially people that focus on international trade uh, they certainly recognize the importance of China. But I think what we're seeing as well is just a greater mainstream awareness of how integral China is to the global economy. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of talk about global inflation. And I think that's exactly right that what Shirley said, uh, that there's a lot of uh, headroom. And in fact, what I'm hearing here in Beijing is that uh, in the uh, upcoming year, uh, that the plans are to actually have the economy run hotter than normally uh, the government would like exactly to stimulate growth. And this, of course, can have uh, global implications on raw materials, uh, inflation, um, et cetera. So I think that this is certainly uh, really, as you said, mm. uh, you know, it used to be when the, U uh, the U.S. sneezes, the rest of the world catches cold. We're seeing uh, now as China perhaps regains uh, its economic health moving past COVID that this will uh, certainly have powerful ripple effects around the world. Uh, Andy, also, you know, Chinese media has been saying that China has set out plans to expand domestic investment and consumption. I mean, what can be done in, in order to actually make that happen? Well, I think there's a couple things. Um, you know, one of the main policy priorities that relate to this is the uh, so-called dual circulation strategy. And this has two components. One is domestic, the second is international. And the domestic component is to strengthen the link between manufacturing, distribution, and consumption. And this is something that many people outside of China might not appreciate because everyone talks about 1.3, 1.4 billion people, the biggest market in the world for many products. Um, but in fact, China is a big market, but it might not necessarily be a strong market, meaning that there's still a lot of regional friction. So one way uh, structurally that the government is looking to increase consumption uh, is by reducing some of these barriers, uh, standardization of rules and regulations across the country, making it so whether you're a foreign company or a domestic company, uh, that you can more efficiently, more quickly manufacture, distribute, reach consumers. And of course, by giving consumers more choices, uh, that of course, I think leads to greater uh, utility to use an economic term or cus uh, consumer well-being. So that's one of the main ways, but there's other things the government's doing as well. Uh, Guido, uh, it looked to me like you were nodding along to some of what uh, Andy was saying. Did you want to jump in? Yes, in fact, uh, what Andy mentioned about consumption is very important. Uh, and uh, it's important for the government, despite being communist, China is one of the most unequal economies, actually. So uh, uh, until uh, China uh, uh, develops a robust middle class, uh, so increases equality, uh, uh, it will be difficult to to rely on domestic consumption. So uh, uh, redistribution uh, is fundamental for growth in China. 
Also, something they should watch out anyway, you know, is the United States, because at the moment, for example, the United States uh, blocked the export of uh, of uh, semiconductors and important other 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 uh, chips uh, uh, containing critical technology, uh, and this could be problematic for China's technology. So I think China, if they really want. Uh, growth in 2023 20, or more uh, to become more than a slogan, they should really focus on updating their technology because that technology uh, has been uh, catching up and to some extent uh, 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 not respecting intellectual property rights completely until now, uh, but now they have to, to do the quality step and become really innovative. And as we have seen recently for COVID, they couldn't manage to, to create uh, effective mRNA uh, vaccines, for example. So there's still some room uh, to, uh, for improvement in this direction. And since they are a well-educated workforce, you know, well-coordinated, they should really focus on, on innovation and technology. Uh, Shirley, uh, fears of recession in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, that has dampened demand for Chinese products, at least for the time being. How likely is it that countries can actually reduce their dependence on China going forward? And if I may put it uh, the other way around, actually a key economic priority from the Beijing's perspective is actually to call for technological self-reliance. Uh, I think uh, personally, uh, China still has quite a few uh, long-term structural economic growth drivers. Uh, High-end manufacturing will continue to be China's uh, new growth engine. Uh, it has uh, this whole sector, uh, particularly manufacturing in the high-end the EVs, et cetera, has consistently grown faster than the broader GDP in China for the past few years. And China today is the world's largest EV manufacturer, the largest EV exporter, and it has a global dominant position in solar and wind supply chains. And China is uh, ironically a uh, leading uh, global power today in biotech and the pharmaceutical sectors. And so um, all these uh, high-end manufacturing not only gives China a pillar of a new economic growth engine, it also helps to recover calibrate uh, the re imbalance between China's uh, domestic economy. So today, uh, China is moving a lot of the digital economy focus to China's uh, West, which is traditionally more backward than the East Coast uh, developments because of the abundant uh, solar energy resources there. So China is moving a lot of the high-end uh, big data computing super centers to China's West uh, to give them essentially a uh, engine for growth uh, in the uh, 21st century digital economy. Uh, Andy, a big picture here. Um, is China's economy ever going to get back to the days of uh, near double digit growth or, uh, or is China basically facing a new normal? No, I don't think we'll see uh, the days of double digit growth uh, again, just because uh, economies go through development phases. And just like uh, an infant grows very, very rapidly, but when they hit uh, childhood, adolescence, uh, the rate of growth slows down. Um, I want to go back to something that Shirley said about uh, the world's dependence on China. I think certainly, though, as the economy evolves, China's economy evolves, uh, this mix is changing as well. So uh, labor costs have gone up in China. Uh, China's looking to move up the value chain as well. And mm -hmm. what this means is that a lot of products that were manufactured and exported, uh, manufactured in China, exported to places like the U.S., now are still being made by China, but perhaps the actual manufacturing is in Southeast Asia or Mexico. And I think this complicates the picture somewhat and certainly makes this much more challenging uh, for American policymakers that are looking to prosecute this uh, quite aggressive uh, series of attacks against China, whether that's technology, or whether that's uh, trade and, you know, this this trend towards decoupling. Uh, so I think there's a lot going on here, but I think uh, the double digit growth days are definitely passed uh, for a number of reasons. The other mm -hmm. reason, too, very quickly, mm -hmm. is the importance of environmental sustainability. So quality growth is the priority now, not just growth for growth's sake. Mm. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Andy Mock, Shirley Ziyu, and Guido Kotsi. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com, 
And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.